the figures which have been presented today, there are some updates as a separate. So I'm just helping yeah. the uh, so the public and for the press. There is an update in terms of some of the final details, but also the figures we've seen do not include the extra money which the government announced a fortnight ago. That's right. Yes. And uh, so these are, you know, so just so everybody's clear about that, and we don't know exactly yet for us how much that extra money is, or uh, we do know the condition. So I just need to show everybody's clear. So yeah, so what we're talking about this morning. Yeah. So so the figures in the table don't include new money. Um, we think it's in the region of about eight million pounds, one off, so not not recurring to 25, 26. And there are two specific recommendations in the paper that would you know delegate to you, leader, um, to make effect of those final changes to those figures to the budget proposal that goes to council on the 23rd of February. Uh, so that's part that's part of the recommendation. Thank you. Yeah. So I mean, it will give all all council. It's not just a, a chance to just look in detail at the final outcome and then uh, obviously we'll have a debate and hopefully get to come some recommendations delegated recommendations uh, before the probably the week before the uh, full council of the fortnight so it's good news to get the eight million but it's a uh, shame we didn't know about it earlier because it would have been a lot smoother okay so michelle you're going to run to sorry no i think you know that just Wipe my script out of the woods. But anyway, um, so the report that's in the pack reflects the discussions at the 9th of January executive, which predominantly. So which report are you referring to? So it's the, Is this the, the, the latest paper we just got. Just the, so. the, no, the, the initial published report yes. updated the information from the 9th of January predominantly to, to include the proposal around the 4.99% council tax. So, so table A that's at paragraph 133 of the original report just demonstrates the movement to um, increase in the council tax to 4.99 from the 2.99 that we had in the original report. And that effectively left us with a small um, surplus. But if we move on from the original report that's published in the papers to the update paper, um, paragraph 1.3 has got an update of that table, um, which includes the movement to the 4.99% council tax, but also includes the council tax base information from the districts and the business base information from the districts that we were waiting for. And that shifted us now to a small deficit position of just over half a million. So that information from the council tax and the business rates has shifted that position from a small surplus from the increase in the council tax to a, a, a small deficit. Um, and that's predominantly to do with, uh, we have some estimates in there about council tax growth. Um, that and some didn't, so it was a bit less than what we'd estimated in our original proposals. So we're starting with the table in the update report with a small deficit position of just over half a million, and, and table B in the report then shows the impacts of that on future years, um, with a 4.99% increase in 24-5 and a 2.99% increase in future years, which, as, as Andrew's just said, still requires the use of reserves over 22 million to balance our budget um, with that scenario. So, as Andrew's mentioned, local government's second month was announced yesterday and be, will be debated in the Commons tomorrow. And that will include the funding that's announced by government, but clearly not in our papers at the moment, whilst we're just still working through the detail of that. Um, we're looking to compare that. So, the update paper does have a figure of around 8.7 in the um, paragraph 1.4. We think it's probably just over 8 million based on what we've seen yesterday. But clearly, the, the final papers into council will need to include those and proposals about how that gets used. <coughs> um, key thing in the report is Appendix E, and, and also Appendix E was updated as part of the update paper, which is the consultation feedback from scrutiny committees, stakeholders, and public consultation. Um, the scrutiny committees and stakeholders were generally supportive of the proposals and recognised the need to increase council tax to maintain the delivery of services. Um, the public consultation this year, an anonymous survey was used by Let's Talk Lincolnshire, which has increased uh, enormously the amount of interaction that we've had with the public around the budget proposals, um, with just over half the responses preferring a 2.99% increase and just under half preferring a higher increase, with 19% supporting the maximum increase to support services. So the paper also includes a refreshed financial strategy and capital strategy, but with no changes in the principles that have previously been adopted by the council in these documents. So I'm quite happy now to, to take any questions or any comments. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. So.
Yes, interesting problem to have. It's, it's not great here because obviously we're, we're just getting information in very late. So obviously papers late of uh, obviously we can be we can discuss. I suppose in terms of the paper that was circulated or this morning, basically in terms of uh, the changes, so that's the update paper of yours. I just um, seems pretty clear, but just clarify some things in there in terms of um, the council the. The figures that came back from the district councils. So just to explain on table C, that's the council tax base. That's the variation from our prediction. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So you you sort of you, your your team and the district team sort of have a best guess. So the the variation is how it and that's turned out slightly more positive, doesn't it? Is that right? I think it's a bit less. So oh, we, we, we assume a growth based on historic data. So uh, not best guess, but historic. No, historically yeah. supported data. This um, is the council, the, the tax base by the district. Yeah. It's the number of properties, which is that. Yeah, it, that? yeah that's right. So that's slightly down. Yeah, so I guess prior to, to, to well, prior to the pandemic, um, the, the tax base was running at about one-ish percent increase per year. Um, so we've had a couple of years where it's been around one and a half percent. So we've adjusted the, the medium term plan accordingly, but it's coming about one point two. Is it? Yeah. 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 Uh, this time around, and I, I guess the reason for that could be a number of ways. Obviously, there's um, uh, you could take it around that you know property growth slowing, um, not as many new homes being built, uh, potential issues around collection with a potential recession on the horizon, etc. Those sort of things all factor into the district's um, maths as they've come together with those tax bases at this. Yeah, so to be clear, we're not. We're, there has been growth, but not yeah, not as not just yet because it's very confusing. Yeah, and I, I won't accuse you of yeah. certain numbers of actually deliberately confusing yeah. it. But yeah. so it, there has been growth in the number of properties yeah. which are taxable, but not as high as predicted. Gone up one point two percent. We thought it would go. Up but so it's uh, in terms of the budget yeah. predictions, yeah. slide down, but overall it's up. Then the next one was the collection fund and this is I'm quite surprised at some of the figures here though just to explain then that is it's quite confusing because where it says plus stroke deficit minus by district so in the chart there table b if it's got brackets is that good or bad that's the deficit position that, so, that. yes <laughs> they've collected less money than they've gone to so if it's a positive figure like let's take city of lincoln they they've done better than so, so their deficit deficits reduced, which is a positive move. But yeah, but they, they yeah, in yeah, in terms of, yeah, not great. So, but that has some quite large variation. I mean, obviously, Boston. You know, how we talk to these people because, frankly, you know, this isn't good enough. So, so the government put out an instruction after COVID that any deficits that were incurred during that COVID period, we could spread over three years. So some of this is still kind of legacy of that, spreading the deficits over three years. But um, some districts seem to be making good progress. And, you know, and compare Boston, for example, which seems to have gone 136,000 in the wrong direction to East Lindsay, which has gone in the right direction. So but what are East Lindsay doing, which Boston are? Because it's no good Boston, for example, moaning that they haven't got money when they're not, uh, it seems to be very good at uh, getting the money in they should be getting. So all of the districts will have to estimate their collection rate at the beginning of the year anyway. So how much of their 100% council tax base they expect to collect. And most of them estimate around 90 or percent, which I think is. So do we know, I mean, have we got figures percentage, percentage rate which each district gathers? We'll have that. Background information, yeah. You could, I think that'll be useful. I mean, the other one that noticed is notable is South Kesteven, which bizarre has gone from a seventy-one thousand surplus to a two hundred thousand deficit. So I don't know. Are we thought, are we asking the district councils why why the, why are these variations? Well, we don't usually get this information until the the end of January. Um, yeah. We get we get we, obviously we're in dialogue with the councils all, all year, and if they've got specific concerns. Um, that usually let us know. We also get consulted on a council tax support funds, so if people aren't paying council tax. So if the average, everybody did the average, because some some seem to have done very well, uh, some seem to have done less well. How much is that actually costing the all the councils in Lincolnshire? Uh, well, the the change, the movement um, there is is nineteen thousand. Um, so that so for example in 
in Boston, there's 136,000 worse off than you. But if, even if, if they were the average, it would be even more, wouldn't Based it? Based on their plan, yes. So have we, have we asked South Kesterman what's going on there? Have, they, have all their, their collection people gone left or what? I would specifically because the same very best obviously. But I think there is an issue, you know, chief executive yeah. wise. It's important that, you know, we do rely on the district. And some, you know, obviously some are doing really well, you know, very, you know, it's a good performance, but it is very variable. It's, and the question for me is why, how come some seem to manage it and some don't? Some of the districts share their revs and bends functions as well. So, um, sorry, some of the districts share their revs, uh, revenues and benefits functions. So they they contribute council tax. So, um, although I don't think so, yeah, well, I, think, I think there is something in terms of talking yeah. to the chief execs because clearly, if somebody's um, really successful at collecting, uh, then they should be sharing their good practice with other district council as well. So, um, I'll take that I think it is. Isn't it? I mean, it's important that yes. you know we all do what we can, and uh, no, I, I take the point about COVID and you know difficult times. But if some districts can seem to do it and some districts can't, is there some extenuating circumstance? Yes, comment. Yeah, can I just say? I mean, I, I think the Boston number definitely jumps off the page. Bearing in mind, um, Boston, East Lindsay, and Southampton have one collection team across the three authorities. So there's something quite clearly going on in Boston. Yeah, uh, and, and that number, that variation, that 289,373, represents a considerable number of properties. Yeah. Um, so what is the local issue that's going on there? Why, why, the, why people aren't paying? So each of the districts has a, a fund as well to support people that approach the districts if they're, you know, they're receiving benefits or struggling to pay their council tax. So there is a, a method for the councils, the districts to support householders if they are uh, struggling. Um, but this obviously reflects outside of that what they're collecting, what they're expecting to collect. So and this is the, the, um, the hot word of immigration in terms of Boston, in terms of uh, transient right. families yeah. leaving their meat not paying, uh, causing uh, causing this issue. <laughs> Definitely conversations trying to get into this and because and there is the fund, but that, I mean, obviously, if people apply for relief, the government, I'm right, the government will give the collection authorities the money. No, no, it's um, all part of the local, it was all delegated to local taxpayers. And, and oh, I see. So it's available, they have their own. But the government will give money, assume, on the assumption that some the percentage of people were, weren't paid, or how's it work? No, so it's all local collected tax and local funding. So we, we as a major preceptor, we get consulted on each year when the district set their fund parameters if you like um but it's all part of the local tax base as well oh, i see so totally local yeah. well, so we we contribute to the funds that the districts operate in terms of a reduced income tax in, uh, income from we, what we we contribute well i don't know what's percentage are we at 60 or 70 percent our, yeah. our share of all of this no it's it's um, yeah 80 percent. so the trouble is if a district's not Doing what it should bluntly, it's they take a twenty percent hit, and we take an eighty percent hit. Yeah. So they're actually, you know, which is why it's beneficial for us to drive. Yeah, the pain again. is felt more by us than them. Bluntly. I know it's all proportionate, but yeah. all, but you know. Can I just also ask about South of Sweden? That's, that's a definitely jumps off the page. Um, in bearing in mind there's a lot of housing growth happening in Stamford and places like that. Um, this number is quite worrying. Is this a local issue because Brampton is stalled in terms of housing, housing growth? Is there something no, that this is, this is on the section need to have on help? How efficient they are collecting them? This is about the consultants they're expecting to get from not collecting. Well, in that so case, there's quite, quite clearly an issue <laughs> going on probably in Grantham. I can imagine the leafy suburbs of Stamford are not paying their jobs. You definitely get some more, and it, it might be that it, I mean, this reflects a point in time, so it might be that it's a timing thing or whatever. Anyway, so if you could uh, produce the percentage collection, because that, that we do see those figures eventually, don't we? Yeah. And indeed, if every district performed as, as well as the best, what would the next gain be for all of us, particularly for this council? Yeah, we can try and pull some of that into the budget book for the council to see if that can help. Lovely. Thank you very much. Well, to just to, on the on the deficit from COVID, is there a way of actually knowing what that is and how long that will take to work its way through? 
and um, we can get that information because so, I say we, we have to reflect it in our accounts the same way the districts had to so um, it's just an instruction from government that that accounting period that we needed to reflect that deficit over a three-year period so we can, we can definitely get that information. Thank you. Does somebody just want to talk about the consultation results this time? You or uh, so I, I mentioned in my discussion about the 100 and, uh, 1,100 surveys, I think, that we got through Let's Talk Lincolnshire. Um, there was predominantly 54%, um, I think, supportive of a 2.99% uh, increase with 19% supporting the 4.99% um, increase. Uh, there were some general comments in the consultation, um, which was themed in the uh, report. So uh, just got some themes here. Introduction. Uh, general themes around comments were about um, cutting staff costs, councillor costs, contracted service provision overcharging, uh, making proper road repairs to avoid refixing. So um, I think I think they're quite general comments. Um, the scrutiny consultation were, was all very supportive. The increase and recognised the need to continue to support services and the stakeholder meeting which we're holding here um which had the union represented uh, representation and business representation also supportive of the changes that we were proposing so i think um, the appendix c has got some of the stats if that helps i think um the they changed the way we access the surveys this year so um previously we've had some people have had to register to acknowledge comments um, this year it was all done as an anonymous submission um, and it's increased the feedback massively from what I can see. So that, that was good. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. So people weren't, if it's going to be hard work. <laughs> yeah, a lot more feedback Thank this year than we've had in, in previous years. Councillor Smith, do you want to just summarise? I know it's a moving thing, so... Yes, so it's just around the board of December. Well, as, as, it from, from, as you were there, I won't go into detail, but I mean, but I th it's certainly something I think the biggest concern that we as a committee probably we'd have, and I'm sure the chairman would agree if he was here, is uh, the the concern that we would have to move to a, a lower base of how much we can spend on our, our services due to financial sentiment. Because obviously, as as, um, as I raised at the meeting with, with the chief exec around certain statutory obligations we've got, uh, that impacts on things that actually our residents really want us to do. So things like they want us, as we said in that budget consultation, they want us to go out once and fix the pothole. Uh, now, you and I both know, Leader, that sometimes that's not a viable thing to do. Uh, and yeah. the reason of why into that. But that, I think that was our biggest concern at, uh, without, without quoting the report sort of verbatim to you, because you'd have had a chance to read it, um, is that's one of the biggest concerns, as, as is uh, educational transport, because that's been, uh, shall I say, a, a concern for a while. But that the Chief Executive and I are going to have a, a meeting to, to discuss that to see what uh, lobbying could possibly uh, be done. Uh, on that, because it's it's just not practical to have legislation that's nearly a hundred years old and to statutory statutory obligation go away and do it, and we're not given the funding and the, the funding package to to deal with that. And uh, I can't see that being any any easier, unfortunately. So it's it's very much a case of lobby as hard as we can, as as already we have been doing uh, with the the eight million that, that's been mentioned. Uh, but it's very much concerning for the next couple of years, and it's sort of keeping an eye on it. As you say, it's very much a moving feast, and I suspect it will continue to be. Uh, with the uh, likely election this year at uh, Westminster level. So it's very much a case of watch this space and do what we we can do to, to sort of fight for our corner, as it were. Yeah. Other comments, questions, please? Do you just want to run, can we talk about the theory of the, just talk about this potential extra 8 million? There are some conditions with it, so just do you want to run through those uh, dark ones? Uh, so um, the additional funding is um, for social care, so children and adults, um, and we are being asked to report back quite regularly now to government on our total spend, particularly on adults, to ensure that um, what we are collecting in adult social care <coughs> precept and the use of the social care grants is effectively going into that area of service. So those are the conditions. Um, that they're not. And they don't want to go into reserves. No, I understand they don't want yeah. to. What they regard as frittering on, on nonsense. Yes. Yeah, so, well, no, that's what the minister said. Yeah, yeah. So there was. Yeah. 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 So Michael, uh, Michael Gove also announced, thought like 
yeah, you know, fortnight ago and, and a bit more information yesterday around the expectation that all councils will have to submit a, a productivity into government by July. Um, so and that covers uh, the sort of things that you'd expect it to cover um, around, um, you know, the ability to deliver savings, uh, the amount of extent you've transformed your services, etc. as well as uh, demonstrating that you're not wasting money. We, we talked about frittering. Uh, not footing running on on certain things, and obviously the the government committed to providing more guidance on that in time. I think one of the interesting things that was in the letter that came out from the Secretary of State yesterday was that future funding might be contingent on the ability to demonstrate progress against that. Uh, how that happened, I don't know. In due course, but we'll see in due course as there's more guidance comes out, and I suspect um, sectoral bodies will be working quite hard to to. Um, provide some guidance on what the expected standard of those documents would look like. So we sort of all in permission by stealth, really. Uh, uh, possibly. Which is the concern, I think, yeah. that you know, yeah. we are going back to the days of uh, having auditors more, well, we have auditors now, but it's fairly light touch. I think the comment was to establish a new productivity review panel made up of sector experts, including the Office for Local Government and the OGA. <laughs> And yeah, right. um, they're also asking um, for our plans to include barriers preventing activity um, to support efficiency that the government can help with to reduce or remove those barriers. Interesting barriers to what prevent efficiency. Yes, that the government can help well, to. Are we to reform national government? Start with that. Yeah, the sentiment's right, but I think there's a risk that you know we've got extra highways money, and now we've got to tell them how many. Miles of uh, road we are researching. I mean, it's all, it is all getting a bit OTT, to be honest. Yes. But having said that, the other sector have been sent councils which have not done our reputation, the whole of the road will not any good at all, but some of the trouble something got into. But yeah, okay. Well, I'm sure we will, uh, we will respond appropriately. It, it does say these plans need to be agreed by council leaders and be published on our website and to, to cover transformation of services, better use of resources, opportunities to take advantage of technology, ways to reduce wasteful spend and support needing well, to remove we have, we have a We have a regular savings, we agree with that, and also we have a substantial sort of transformation plan. So this should be fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that is part of the uh, discussion and calculation of how we move on from here where we are present. Any further questions? Absolutely. Just that you know that obviously this is one off money. Yeah. So we have to be careful in terms of how we spend it in relation to that social care because we all know we've got an increasing demand on the service, more people coming into the system, and we've got more people moving mm -hmm. into the country yeah. who are in that bracket who are going to need services in the next few years, probably. So you know we're going to need to think this through very, very carefully, I would say, because if, if there's no additional money in the future, we just put ourselves in a position where we're delivering services that we have to then find our own money to, to continue the function with. So we need to think this through and be very careful about it. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, I, I just feel a little bit hard done by because I think we're getting penalised by a lot of councils that are actually overspending in their adult care and their children's services. You know, we, we're running a balanced budget of adult care and children's services trying to value for money and, and an excellent service, I feel, with, with as Colin just said, the amount of older people that's moved here um, and with our, you know, children's services, uh, with, with the um, uh, foreign residents that you've got with the children there that we're taking on. So I just feel a bit that government are just sort of picking on, on not on just on us, but they're giving us this extra money. A lot of council would be really pleased about that because they haven't got, haven't got that extra money. Whereas, you know, adult care and children's services and all our services in the council, we have run a balanced budget and we, we run an excellent budget, I feel. And I just think we're getting a little bit penalised by government because other councils aren't doing their job as they should. Yeah, but I think, we, I mean, obviously, it's, it, I think we all should be grateful for getting there. Oh, no, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm grateful. And, and, and particularly with the town council network, uh, by a very effective campaign, which <coughs> actually was listened to by government. No, as you're right, there are, you know, I mean, I actually signed the letter on with other leaders uh, pointing out the challenges, but we have challenges so here, which we know we, we, in terms of uh, SCND 
home school trend, things like that. We know we are holding the line just, but it's only just. So I did think it was, and the government, of course, put on the um, national living wage, but then didn't fund it, which <clears throat> is a bit questionable in terms of, you know, extra burdens. They're supposed to fund extra burdens. They didn't in this case. So in a sense, we lost, I can't remember how much we lost from, you know, that cost us six million. So in fact, you could argue the eight million sort of covers the extra cost for us for the national living wage. So I think you're right, though, that in some councils I know, majority are, well, I think we're in a minority who are actually living within our budget just. So I suppose the question is in terms of what we've just heard, in terms of social care, what one, is there, I mean, that's what we need to look at. Is there some one-off investment we could make in social care, which would, bearing in mind Colin Davis' point about it is one-off money. One hopes the government next year, this would be different government then, will actually acknowledge, you know, there's an issue here, but I suppose the issue for us is what could you spend one off which would give you a permanent and long lasting benefit? We've got the transformation plan, haven't we? Indeed, is there something else we could do in the transformation plan which would give us a long standing benefit? But I just put that to you. Any thoughts on the hoof, really? I mean, we have a, a range of programmes that are in place um, which cover prevention, and so it's it's relatively straightforward to scale those for things that we can do for a year and then and then pull back if necessary. And that is all designed so that it should have an impact on reducing future demand. So we're not we're not baking in. And the, the, the challenge with things like national living wage, as you say, the the funding for for next year broadly balances that because the national living wage is forever, and when they make an increase. You know, in future years, it will be on top of that. So we have to be very careful with fee rates because those you know, we can't get back. But there are there are things that we have in mind uh, and can can do on a, a preventative basis that can be scaled up and then scaled back if if necessary. I'm sure on the children's side. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think on the children's side, we've already discussed. You know, as a as a council, we've invested mm -hmm. early in trying to mitigate some of these risks, and we've always got plans around how we can invest further to mitigate those risks and also how we reduce our risks at the market. So it might be that, you know, this this funding will contribute to the costs we have seen that are within the, the cost pressures already. Whilst we do that other work that we've already talked about in terms of looking at children's homes, looking at provision so that we can bring some of our some more of that provision back in house and protect ourselves a little bit more from that market volatility that we've experienced. OK, thank you. Any further comments? OK, well, there's uh, one of the additional papers then on the recommendations, which hopefully you've all uh, seen in the in the email we sent out <coughs> this morning. Again, apologise, but, you know, we, you know, obviously didn't, if you don't get the information until last yesterday afternoon, obviously it was all a bit, uh, I would say, up in the air. So basically the recommendations are saying we uh, we we know uh, all the information which is in the, the main report, uh, and then with the recommendations say as they were in terms of um, council tax levels and in terms of the adjustments, the technical adjustments. But the, I suppose the two important ones, well, the two changes are item four, which I'll read out, request the leader to review and amend the executive budget recommendations to the council as appropriate in respect to the final settlement if received. Uh, so we have received it, but we haven't had time to fully analyse it. Uh, so probably that needs uh, amendment, I think, doesn't it? That last sentence. And number five, <clears throat> request the leaders to review and amend the figures within the medium plan, medium term financial strategy to be recommended. So that's uh, similar, but that's obviously whatever we decide to recommend to do <clears throat> in terms of um, council tax levels or whatever, that will then actually uh, affect the medium term financial strategy. Effectively, it's saying that giving a, a me the ability to come with if we so desire we will have to decide what we do with this eight billion uh, because it, <coughs> got to do something with it so that gives the opportunity to come up with some uh, revised proposals uh, so that is that uh, i'll propose that from the chair another seconder councillor baby all those in favor <coughs> thank you agreed thank you very much and again i think no okay thank you for that then thank you very routine. Okay, then. So, let's get back to my. You don't.
Yeah, the next item then is North Highcombe Relief Road, Land Assembly, Preparation of Highway Matters. <clears throat> is it you, Sam? Or is it okay. you had to start with that? give a very uh, brief introduction. Uh, as members are aware, we're progressing with the uh, North Highcombe Relief Road scheme. It's currently in full planning consent, and hopefully we'll get a decision on the planning application uh, later in the spring. Um, this report is about um, doing in parallel the start of the process as required for the compulsory purchase orders. The report sets out, obviously, the options that we have in either doing this in parallel, which doesn't prejudice uh, the planning decision made, or waiting until the planning decision is made in that stage of the process. So, the recommendation in front of you is that we uh, proceed and process in parallel some of the benefits of starting that process and the necessary requirements of being ready to uh, follow the compulsory purchase order procedures. Uh, okay, thank you. More, morning all. So yeah, as, as Andy's outlined, um, following the last time we were executive and um, we to seek approval to, to submit the final application, that was submitted on the 31st of October. It was validated in mid-November and we're still going through that planning determination process now. The uh, comments period has ended, although we may still receive some, and we're working through those comments following the planning application, which is all on the planning portal and transparent for everyone to see. Uh, as Andy suggested, we're looking for spring, potentially May, uh, planning a res committee for that planning process, but depends on how, uh, as we go through the comments, but that's the aspiration at the moment. Now, historically, what, what we've done is we've uh, waited until planning is built, and after the start of the legal order orders process to reduce to reduce risk and cost and things like that. There's effectively two there's two processes to, to the legal order. One is preparing your legal orders, and that's a case of a static process writing out to landowners, those interested, basically saying, what's your interest in your land? We have a, a large um, um, sort of um, uh, data set already from land registry. But the reason you have to statutory through section 16 notices notices right out is because there's some elements of land that aren't recorded on land registry. And I've rarely done a scheme that someone doesn't have some deeds in the loft that nobody knows about, and you have to you have to statutorily write out to do that. The second process is once you've gathered all that data, you've drafted your orders about creating rights, abolishing rights, changing rights, then you publish the orders. And that's and that, and that's the key thing there. So there are actually two separate processes. So what we're looking to do to expedite the delivery of the scheme is to gain a, a key decision today to allow us to um, to prepare the orders, to do that investigation, to write out the Section 16 notices. It does not, as Andy says, it does not predicate or, or prejudice the planning process in any way. This is what we're doing in tandem. We couldn't, we, we could never publish those orders until planning is secured or if it's secured. Um, and, but it really is it's effectively doing our due diligence now to use this, this period of time when we're waiting for planning determination to get our ducks in a row of ones that are better for us. So that, that's, that's the main emphasis behind us to, to give us the, the rights. At the same time, we think it's prudent to request rights to enter into land negotiations, <coughs> although we will continue to follow the CPO so that the council has the fallback position should negotiations not get to a, a, an agreement point. But we are seeking the the authority to carry out those negotiations as as, as we are informing now as we've been uh, liaising with landowners and stakeholders for quite some time. The final part of this is the where we tie into panels roundabout at the western location, that is National Highways Network. So much as if a developer was come onto the county council's highway network, they would need a what we call a section two seven eight agreement to come onto our network. We need the same thing to go on to the National Highways Network for Section 6. So effectively, that's not our land. It's probably not National Highway. Is there highway, is there highway rights? So we have to set Section 6 agreements with the, with the National Highways and we have to go on there and start those discussions. Uh, it basically runs tandem with the rest of it. Uh, the Section 6 agreement is something we've done many times before. We've been like Grand Prix Southern Leaf Road, Teal Park. Many years ago, and it's a fairly standard documentation, but it is a legal documentation. <laughs> so I guess that, that probably summarizes the report. Um, but again, I will stress just to be absolutely clear, this does not um, impact the planning process. It's a completely separate objective process 
should the planning not be approved or, or it be delayed in any way, then we can still collate this, um, this, this preparation, but we can't publish it later. And we will come with that future key decision report to this executive to publish those orders, probably summer or, or autumn this year. Thank you, Sam. Councillor Brooks, once we went to your scrutiny committee. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, uh, yes, this came to the Scrutiny Highways and Transport Scrutiny Committee on the 29th of January and the report was considered and it was unanimously agreed uh, by the committee to support the recommendation to the executive. Um, there's some points that were raised and highlighted in discussion. Um, firstly, members sought some clarification on potential additional funding for the project from the uh, Nash Network, Network North project, um, which was mentioned in the introduction, and uh, officers conveyed that detailed information from the government was still pending. So uh, there was a specific inquiry into how much we might expect from that. And it was uh, again clarified that communication from the government on the matter was yet to be received. <laughs> There was also concerns were raised regarding the compulsory land purchase process and it prompted questions on how property prices are determined. Uh, officers explained that negotiations were the primary avenue, but where necessary, compulsory purchase orders were being employed. They emphasised that the residential properties were the main focus and valuations adhered to the no scheme world uh, principle. Uh, thirdly, members sought some information on the parallel process with the planning applications uh, and the public awareness, uh, because, uh, you know, it would seem that we could be putting the cart before the horse by going through this process before uh, planning's uh, consented. And officers assured the committee that major landowners were actively engaged and extensive public consultation had already taken place. Uh, they underscored the. Um, um, so sorry, I just yeah, they underscored. Uh, sorry, I've, I've, I've gone on. Apparently. They were asking how the pro property prices are often explained that negotiations with the primary avenue. Uh, but where necessary, we uh, adhere to the no scheme world principle. Uh, members also sought information on the parallel process of the planning application, as I said, uh, because there was concern that it would look like we were putting the cart before uh, the horse. Um, they um, assured us that the planning process is distinct from the compulsory land acquisition and that the report at, at hand primarily addresses preparatory matters. Importantly, officers stressed the decision to proceed with the compulsory purchase orders would only be made post the granting of planning consent. Uh, lastly, in uh, reference to collaboration with National Highways, uh, a member inquired about the potential challenges in engagement. Officers responded, highlighting that the Section 6 agreement was standard and our relationship with National Highways remained overall positive. Additionally, the officers provide information regarding a commuted sum, which is likely payable as part of the agreement for future maintenance uh, of the asset created by this project. Again, in summary, the Highways and Transport Committee has unanimously supported the recommendation presented to the executive. Apologies for the little mix up in the middle there, uh, yes. leader. Thank you very much, Mike. No, that was fine. It was very clear, very substantial. Uh, do we just want to deal with the, each of those uh, issues which we raised in turn? So the first one was about Network North. To explain that is the uh, the HS2 money. So can I just in terms of we do we bid for our because do we explain the process and whether the realistic realistic prospect of this particular project getting currently we've been given 100, 110 million allocated by government. But just can one of you explain what yeah, what's wrong? So at the outline business case process, so back in 2020, I think, or 21, when we started the process, when we got basically the allocation of 110 million, as you said, 
the scheme estimate at that time for the outland business case was 154 million. So there was 70% from the DFT and 30% from the county council. Um, during that early stages, we procured about for BT. Obviously, we, the world did something very, very different and construction inflation increased significantly. We saw a 23 to 24% increase, which took us to the current one, 193 million pound uh, cost that we're quoting at the moment. Now, the Network North policy paper that came out, uh, as you say, is this sort of HS2 funding that goes to the Midlands and the North. There was a very clear statement that those are the large local majors, the LLM schemes of which the North Hiking Relief Road is, is set to receive additional funding up to 100% of the outline business case. So that's the 154 million. So if we were to receive the 100% of the outline business case, that would increase the funding from the DFG from 110 to 154 million. Obviously, the authority would still need to fund the gap of 39 million to 193. So that's what's been put in, put in paper towards the end, I guess it was about the the last year. What we haven't seen since then is any, any meat to that, any, any detail within that. Um, we've also, I must stress, not, not heard or received anything negative when you turn them back against that either. I think my, my first view is I think we will unlikely see anything um, detailed or in writing until we get to the final business case stage. And that will likely be middle to end of 2025. That's when the final business goes, that's when the funding is completely yeah. unlocked. That's my gut feeling, but at the moment it's yeah. uncertain what happened between them. But that's the information that we've been given today. So in terms of other schemes, is that the only scheme we could apply for or are there others? In that particular funding stream, that's so it, it's, it's, there's no other schemes <coughs> ongoing which would be qualified. Not for that particular. Not for that particular, because hey, it's an ongoing allegedly like, new government. Yeah, obviously, there funding streams. There's uh, lits being talked about, local infrastructure, transport, and uh, about funding bids into that. But there's discussion that might be formulated basis rather than bid basis. It's a little uncertain at the moment. Well, we'll see anyway. <laughs> Yeah, green government, there'll be lots of cycle lanes, so you know, bypasses. Okay, and then we move on to the uh, CPO, which you talk compulsory repair to us. Just, I suppose the key question is uh, that's because we've actually done most of the work, as you said. Are there any actually, apart from the land, are there any houses left actually we need to so CPO? There is, there is one house that right. we're going through the process now. So all the other houses have been purchased many one, years many ago. Years ago. And just to be clear on the plan, we'll see that they're in the area to be compulsory purchased, even though Lincolnshire owns it. That's what it's about. That's just the price. Yeah, you have to uh, distinguish all rights to re-establish the rights. And we're sort of compulsory purchasing our own properties, but that's fine. But there's one property that is uh, is yet to be bought. They served a blight notice on us about two, two to two and a half years ago that was accepted. So they are in the process of moving. We have agreed a negotiation of value of that property. We're effectively waiting for that property owner to find another house. The latest information I got last week is they found one and they're just going through the legal processes as you do when you move house and things like that. We are at a, 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 an odd stage because the blight notice only lasts for three years. So they are getting very close to that. So we're trying to push the legal team to complete the form of three years. Otherwise, um, the authority has actually the right to purchase that property but that's not the relationship we, we want to be doing. But we also don't want to get into the realms of having, it's because it's not unless it's on the landowner to choose to, to serve another blight notice, which in theory the authority could take a different view on. Uh, the other auto that we're looking into is whether we did purchase the property and rent it back out to them. So there's various different scenarios we'll look into, um, but I suggest it's sort of detail at this stage because the property owners are perfectly accessible. They've instigated the blight notice to the council to purchase their property. So also for 20 years now we've been ever since the line was protected. So is, is this just one who person who didn't really want to engage or so back when we purchased all the other properties, they had eligibility to issue a flight that chose not to can't force that upon them. All the other properties sort of suggested we want out uh, and issued a blight notice. This property didn't until I would, I would guess until the outline business case was approved and became more real. Um, than maybe it was before and thought, okay, I want to move now. Okay, fine. Um, so that seems to be in hand then. So are confident that will uh, go through? Because some of them we have bought the house and rented, let them stay at the okay. residence to, so they don't have to move until, until yeah, yeah, the bulldozers appear. 
whether it's whether their tendency, yeah. but they're all very aware and yeah. we, we're not going I think we took a view that, you know, that once we knew where the line was, give people every opportunity to either sell and leave or, you know, stay put and wait, uh, which is good. So uh, the next one then is the twin tracking. Is there a risk on the twin tracking? There's not a process risk. They are completely separate processes and this doesn't prejudice anything at all. Um, I guess there could be a perceived risk from the public, but again, all I can stress is the planning process is the planning yeah, process. We've got, Andy, is there a, a risk? I don't believe so. Um, the the fact that we are starting our due diligence on a legal process and we can't press the button to actually formally start the CPO processes until or if final permission is granted uh, doesn't create any uh, risk per, per se. As Sam has indicated, the perception might be your second guessing for the planning process is separate to this legal process and therefore that, um, I don't believe there's a risk attached to it. At some point, we would start this due diligence process. We're just preparing ourselves so that in readiness it, for when a planning permission is granted. If a planning permission isn't granted, we can't start the formal CPO process. It's difficult to see who would challenge, but you never know. Who. Yeah, I mean, the planning process, obviously, as Sam's indicated, the formal notification period has ended. There is an extension of, <coughs> an extension of time was granted to Natural England, uh, specifically uh, because they've raised some issues. That process has been worked through. Um, all of the other statutory consultees had responded within the time, haven't raised anything that was of particular concern. Uh, as you're aware, in the context of how the planning process works, you need to make sure that they, the due process is followed there so we don't create a risk of any further challenge to that. Uh, the number of formal comments made by members of the public was very few in comparison to a scheme of this sort of size and nature that you might have expected. We've also tried to safeguard it in, uh, in the past, we've come from one key decision which delegates the approval to, to publish the orders. We've not put that in this paper so that we distinctly have to come back to this executive for a full-blown discussion about whether we want to publish it after that. And the sort of uh, pedestrian cycling, has that all been resolved? There were some issues, were well. there? Uh, in terms of challenges, potentially. Yeah, the, 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 well, I suppose there was a few comments throughout the three public engagement events over the 18 months, and we've enacted the, all those changes and all those views into the planning so application. We, we've, sat, we've satisfied the so, yeah. yeah. And the final one, it's all, it's all hunky-dory with the national highways. So <laughs> will we be having to pay? If I still remember when we drilled the A46 there road, the, um, well, I won't say what I've called them, but they actually then charged us a load of money as ransom. So hopefully we're not in that situation. Because if we have the nonsense of the local taxpayer giving money to the national tax. So oh, is it just going to be a cost-free transaction, this? It's fair to say the policies have been changed in the period and I was on site at the TO Park for two years and I remember it very well. But the whole I was and I forget how it was ridiculous outrageous actually. So we won't know the values, but effectively when because you are building a larger asset that they take on, they charge and the community lump sum additional costs over 40 years to maintain that asset over that period. I won't give any personal views into that, but it is effectively charging a local authority to maintain that public climate. But that is the process, it's a legal process, and they have they have a right to it. I was certainly having a discussion with National Highways about whether that's appropriate and whether that, that's right, but we can't, if they instigate it, there's very little. Can I sort of have the roundabout then? Are we talking just for the roundabout? Yes. Because the rest of it isn't theirs. Yeah, absolutely. We are talking just the roundabout. So it's what sort of sums are we talking about? No, National Highways don't engage a uh, project's sponsor until you secure a plan. So they won't, they don't get into the detailed conversation. They make sure you've got the mission, then they come with a big fat check. Bill, they want to. I mean, it's not, it's not a sensible way of going on, frankly. We get it, you know, you, with all all these claim goes, they're all charges, don't they? And it's all effectively taxpayers' money. But, so we don't know that is, but no, it's all going smoothly as long as we pay up. That's what you say. <laughs> yeah, I think in English that's exactly what you <laughs> There we go. I mean, surely we've already paid so much. So if they did go along that line, it would only be an additional. We're only widening that roundabout one. It is it's a bit more than one. It is it is massive this roundabout. It's, it's more than twice the size of the existing roundabout. The four lane entries and things like this. This is a significant size increase. 
with traffic signals on where there aren't now, there now, so they'll be greater to maintain on that. So I can understand the level of greater maintenance. You could argue that there are issues with that roundabout now and offset against which we wouldn't have those discussions with them. Yeah, because we're effectively giving them a brand new roundabout again, aren't we? Exactly, and that will form part of my discussions with them about uh, better. Well, let's say they want to do something on one of their roads, which affects our roads. Can we then charge them? Yes. Or do we? Uh, it has it come it up? very rarely affect our no. roads, but it would be the same as if a developer or you know, an internal drain board, the EA County network, we can charge them. If they are changing or creating a digital asset for us to manage, we have a process of, of um, calculating and charging to be two bumps on. Very good. Any further questions, comments then? A good scheme, but uh, that's all going to plan there. So there are quite a few recommendations there. Page one hundred eighty-three, which I won't read them all, but basically are the process whereby we the next stage happens with the twin tracking, as has been said, and not delegate uh, to the director of base in consultation with the portfolio holder. Uh, for two items at the end. So all those in favour of the recommendation, please share it. Thank you. All agree, thank you. That's unanimous. Is alert. We move on to the next one, which is submission of business cases for capital funding under the greater link uh, devolution day. So before I hand over, basically this is um, this is the money we have um, been given by government for entering the process in terms of uh, a greater uh, a devolution deal for this area. So some people think it's uh, dependent upon uh, us actually agreeing the devolution deal. No, this is actually just a, a reward, I suppose you call it, and what you call it. So we have been, uh, Great Venture has been given 28 million, um, of 20 million of which uh, has been agreed will be spent in the linkage area. So Justin's shaping up that. So I presume you're going to add anything else. Thank you, you Councillor Hill. So so yes, this this paper takes you through the projects that we've proposed submitting the exceeding 20 million um, and it asks that the executive approves those 20 million pounds of projects and approves a process in which you Councillor Hill um, in conversation with Andy as the director of place, um, agree to the detailed business plans that we submit into government. So there are six projects, and I am aware that there is a typing error in the paper that at one point it says five. So to be clear, there are six projects and six is affordable. Um, and those projects are listed on page 204 of the report. Now, it's important to recognise that the criteria that the government gave us for this funding was very, very strict and rigid. It had to be capital, it had to be spent in financial year 24-25, and it had to be spent on activity within the Department of Leveling Up spend um, rules. And that meant that what we did was a, a piece of work which was to look at the prospectus for devolution, which set out what our priorities were for the first wave of devolution. An exercise where we looked at the um, different projects that were eligible for the prospectus and were able to be delivered within the time frame because of the feasibility and et cetera work that we had already done and an exercise that ensured that there was a reasonable coverage across the county, which with 20 million pounds doesn't enable us to put everything everywhere. So that gave us the, the list of projects which are identified on page 204. So a Food Valley grant programme to improve productivity within the food sector, flood prevention schemes, a streetworks programme in Grantham, improvements to the transport corridor in the Lincoln area, including Nettle and Roundabout, and some improvements to Carhoe Road, um, a re resurfacing and making old Roman bank in Sandylands far more attractive to visitors, 
and a grant towards the next stage of Sleep at More Enterprise Park. So those are the projects that we are proposing that we submit. It's worth reflecting on two more things. First of all, program management and risk. So Lindsay's with me today. Lindsay will be program managing the bundle of projects and set out on page 2R5 are a series of risks and how we propose to mitigate them through using framework suppliers, through taking people off other tasks and through monitoring the projects very, very closely against their performance indicators. Now, I need to say that the time frame is risky and therefore we will be working as we complete any business plans to ensure that any partner input is deliverable and we will be working as hard as we can to make sure that we are ready to deliver and government give us the go ahead. We had meetings with government yesterday. Um, we are a little bit concerned it might take you more than six weeks in which to turn around the business cases, which of course will have an impact on us when we're trying to do something about that. The very final thing I've mentioned, Councillor Hill, as you said at the start, this is um, a set of projects for now based upon what is deliverable now. At the same time, we are working with um, members of the executive and with managers across the council to identify a pipeline of strategic projects that will support economic growth across Greater Lincolnshire in the coming years. So Sam Edwards, who, who spoke on the previous paper, has been working with Councillor Davis on a number of transport schemes. Um, my team are working with Councillor Davy on a number of business development schemes. And Nicole Wilson's team will be working with Councillor Davy on a number of environmental schemes. So we will be looking at the strategic approach as well as that operational one. And I think I'll pause there, Councillor Hill. Thank you. Well, Lindsay looks quite calm at the moment, anyway. Very positive. <laughs> so it went to overview and scrutiny, Councillor Smith. So uh, you'd obviously, you were there again, leader, and <clears throat> uh, questions were raised about why certain schemes weren't included, which uh, as has been explained, I think, as, as the uh, committee said, overall, uh, no one's going to say no to uh, funding and improved roads. So very, very happy that, uh, that they're there and that those improvements are being made, and hopefully it's there. Uh, the start of a, a longer journey where, uh, shall I say, more uh, open conversations had with uh, up the chain of command, as it were, and uh, we we can use the uh, possible new potential new status of uh, being a devolved authority for the benefit of uh, the residents of Lincolnshire. But you had a copy of the, so I went to quote it verbatim because you've all had a copy of it. Thank you. Too much. So, um, obviously, you first you did mention that a, a misunderstanding, shall we say, that certainly. Boston has mentioned that they got nothing. Can you just explain what the food value is and why Boston will be a the Boston area yeah. will be a major beneficiary of this money? So our UK Food Valley Grant program is going to be all about helping business productivity in the food manufacturing sector. And in terms of Boston, we know that something like six times the national average of people are employed in food manufacturing. And we know that the food manufacturing sector is going through change. It needs to be better at meeting the um, zero carbon targets that the major multiples are giving to the food manufacturing sector. It needs to be productive around the cost of its product by looking at making its, um, its processes more efficient. And so the UK Food Valley Programme will provide grant support to those organisations who help businesses to improve their productivity. We believe that we will spend a significant proportion of the funding on the National Centre for Food Manufacture which of course delivers a lot to businesses in both the South Holland area and the Boston area. And we have had some early conversations 
with the Centre for Food Logistics, which is based at Boston College, and we would expect them to play a strong role in the UK food value. So there are a number of schemes there. It's probably worth saying as well, Councillor Hill, that when we submitted the bid for levelling up fund for the A16 improvements, and the choice was to focus that on helping food businesses in the Boston to Spalding corridor to be able to get their products to market faster. In that bid, we spoke about increasing productivity in other matters like the production process. And that's what this UK Food Valley programme is about. So to me, it will do a lot for businesses in the food sector in the Boston area, and it will augment the investment that you've already made in that A16 corridor improvement scheme. And then the, the improvement you mentioned actually is in the Boston Borough yeah. government. And obviously the other comments was that the, the bids were submitted by Boston Borough Council when we went round asking, none of those were successful. Can you explain why? So there were three submitted, two of which were not consistent with the, you know, the, with the prospectus we put in for devolution. So one was around health and leisure, and what's a big problem? One was not consistent with prospectus. That's the one around health and leisure. One was a scheme which was for a brownfield land purchase, and we could not use the Department of Leveling Up's funding through this scheme for brownfield land activity. And then the third scheme was to do some early work on local development orders for some new industrial estates, which would have been. Um, revenue-based funding, and therefore we felt that we wouldn't be able to pursue that one either. Okay, but obviously, as uh, as we hopefully pointed out, that if the devolution bid does go ahead, obviously that will give us more flexibility in future, and we won't be tied up with all these conditions because we'll get the the pot of money, and it will be then locally determined. Um, the flood prevention schemes, and I think that was there was some. Uh, but that is new schemes, but I see from, as it says in the paper, it is preparatory work to actually uh, generate match funding from other partners. Yeah, it, it is It is new schemes. It is, it is over and above the funding that, that you as an executive made available. I have to say I spoke about the risks and of bringing partner organisations to the table. The Environment Agency are as you know, exceptionally busy as a result of recent storms, and we are working hard to bring them to the table. If we're not able to do so, then we may need to adapt that flood schemes project. Um, but if there were any elements that we weren't able to do, then I would assume that you would want us to commit to putting those into the pipeline of schemes into the future because flood prevention is so important. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, I think the other one is the concern. Uh, there's some technical stuff on the Sleaford, but we're confident that will proceed now if they, they get up. So the issue is the big challenge and how long do we, because if we sit here waiting for the government to turn it round, have they given a commitment? Because obviously the longer they... <laughs> less time we will get how to deliver, so I don't know. They've given us a commitment of six to eight weeks. It was in meetings with them yesterday. So then we're down to a year, which is yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, so Lindsay was in a meeting yesterday, which was quite frustrating, and we have gone back to them to say, we should be working on this together. You need to accelerate some of that work. If over the next 10 days or so, we don't have a lot of progress on that, then I'll certainly be speaking to you and the chief executive about whether there's something we can do to remind them of the importance of getting these approved. I mean, sure. I mean, I know they're, they're obsessed with financial year ends, aren't they? But they hopefully will uh, there'll be some flexibility there. But, uh, it is a Concern that, uh, and is there, I mean, I presumably we are doing what we can to get ready without yeah, committing. I mean, so these are all things are good things, so we can at risk. You know, I, mean, I suppose these are an appetite for 
bit about risk spending, shall we say? Yeah, so, so, so we had a good discussion yesterday. Um, you know, they were talking about a four to six week window, but the business cases are, in, are shaping up really, really well. So that's really positive. Um, I've been talking to our partners about submitting them um, on an ad hoc basis and um, that helps them with their assessment process. A lot of the discussion was around um, the proportionality of assessment because this is slightly out of their normal assessment process. So I think what happens sometimes with the business cases is they get sent into individuals within other departments. And I just wanted to make sure that other people understood the proportionality that we discussed. Um, so we are in we are in good shape there. Um, and, and the teams are working really hard at bringing those projects forward. So I'll certainly be in constant discussion with, with the teams that deal up to progress. You, you use the words at risk spending, Councillor Hill. I think if we get to a point where we believe the government have approved, but they haven't sent the letter to us, then we'll probably have a word with you and with Andrew about whether we're confident to move ahead knowing we've got a verbal agreement that that's what we can work out. I'm just going to emphasise, Councillor Hill, in the context of the list of projects and just in starting point in terms of the projects that are ones that we have a level of confidence over our ability to manage and control that process. A number of them aren't entirely new in the context of where we were. So some of the transport works, they're already projects that have a level of activity already. We've already committed to working um, on the Trans Midlands Trade Corridor, really aware of the ongoing discussions that we've had about improvements on that route. So we're not starting from a standing start, but there is still a, a risk that we need to manage as we go forward. So for example, in terms of the, um, the 9 million on the old Roman bank, are, are we lining up a contractor? Because they usually need some time to mobilise. Yeah, we are massively happy in terms of being ready to actually sort of hit the ground with it as soon as the sort of sign off on, on that. Um, that's probably one of the carries and well, it sounds going to keep me from behind, but it carries the least risk in terms of our readiness to mobilise and progress because it's a project that's been worked up in previous iterations in the past and been on the on the agenda as of some of the council data's expectations. Yeah, and yeah. slapping out some tarmac. What what could be from the plan? <laughs> yeah, well that's good. Which is I mean it's good to have the money, but it is frustrating it just to have, you know, for you know, in terms of two one point five million scheme, the you know, the whole weight of government sort of uh checking goes bearing down and in their terms it's peanuts, isn't it? You do something mm -hmm. that's one more, but well, is there anything that could, because obviously it's a wider list of mm -hmm. the ones that we've chosen to put forward, is there anything that could go in if something was likely not to be? I don't know what items are. Um, governments want us to spend yeah. money, notwithstanding the comments that you've just made. And we are very clear in, in choosing the list that these are ones that we have the most confidence in delivery. I think if we had a problem, then we may need to look for a reserve project. I'm quite nervous of doing that, given that you know, the, the choice of these projects has been scrutinised significantly. And therefore, as, as we discussed at overview and scrutiny, it's a sort of a a confidence that we need to give to people that we took the decision and therefore we'll do everything we can to deliver those. But if the choice were do not spend all of the money or find something else, then I'd certainly be coming back to you and recommending that we find something else, but I'd hope not to be. Yes, Andy. Another option that we could possibly consider, depending on the scale of any risk that we were encountering, was looking as to whether we actually wanted to supplement the amount of resource that's going into this list of projects, given the scrutiny that's gone into picking this list. So in a grant scheme in terms of the UK food valley, extending that could be an option. We also know that the ask from the uh, North East even in terms of sleep and more bit, business part, enterprise part, was larger than we were actually giving them. So there may be ways in which we retain our risks within the existing project, rather than to go for something else and be starting well past the, the game line. In terms of real risk, I can't think of any time when 
remember all the European funding. I've never. It, was there? Is there any example where it's there's been a slight overshoot in terms of delivery, but actually the money is being retracted? I can't think of one. I think normally, pragmatically, you know, who wants to be saying, well, you know, we're clawing the money back. You know, I just think in reality, it, ha it is quite common. It used to be very common in European funding, didn't they, just it? And I think the, re the pragmatism really was, although there was an expectation that a little leeway was given, is normally given. And they want these projects yeah. to be successful. The only bad I have known has been when projects have simply not delivered what they said. So, you know, we will take 2,000 businesses, well, actually, we helped 85. It's, 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 it's the magnitude of that, I think. But nonetheless, we've been a really trying to do it. Okay. Any further comments, questions, please? Okay. Recommendations there for. Pages 201 and 202, basically to agree with the list of six, which we've discussed, and then delegate to um, the director of place in consultation with myself to do the yeah. adjustments as required. All those in favour, please show. All agreed. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you for that. Right, it's all right, one there. Yeah. Thank you. Risk management. So, yeah, for it. Thank you, Lydia. Um, I'm happy to present this paper detailing the community risk management plan, which replaces our integrated risk management plan. So, a community risk management plan is uh, a legal requirement under Section 21 of Fire and Rescue Services 2004 um, through the Secretary of State and the Fire and Rescue National Framework in 2018, which requires Linkage Fire and Rescue to produce a plan that identifies and assesses all foreseeable fire and rescue related risks that could affect our communities. And now I'll hand over to, uh, to, to Mark Rax, the Chief Fire Officer, who will take you through the paper. Okay. Um, the, uh, the first thing I just want to um, point out, there's this, obviously there's a change of name and a change of branding of the Community Risk Management Fund. Um, as Lindsay said, within the uh, national framework, it is a, uh, a duty to produce a, an IRMP, which is an integrated risk management plan, which uh, we have been uh, running for the, the previous four years. Um, through the National Fire Peace Council, uh, the sector has uh, standardised uh, these plans and uh, come to the view that um, all future plans should be now being branded as a community risk management plan. So it's just making sure that people are not getting um, confused that we're not actually delivering against the framework. It's just a change to title. Um, it's fundamentally the same. Um, as uh, as Lisa quite rightly said, this is um, really based on our assessment of community risk, um, which we see, which is current, but also really what we see as the next four years. Um, and it's outlining uh, in the face of the, the whole of the CRMP is our understanding of what the uh, current and future risks are. It's really trying to understand um, from a blended approach through um, historical data, through um, obtaining uh, several data sets uh, with uh, partners, looking at what the future demographics could potentially look like um, and looking at the, um, at the type of population in, re in regards to risks. That we look like. We also link in regards to the National Strategic Risk Assessment and our own Community Risk Register to give a, a blended approach to what we understand as the risks are. Um, then the, the purpose of this strategic document is really trying to outline um, what those risks are in regards to groupings, what are our organisational risks, i.e. what are our potential barriers to deliver against that, um, and then also it just gives some high level um, strategic statements in regards to how we intend to deliver this over the next uh, four years. Um, this starts what we class as a, a golden thread that runs through um, the, uh, the organisation, which really keeps us focused on our four year plan. But then we have a, an annual service plan that focuses on what are our priorities on a year by year basis that will help us collectively um, um address what we see as the risks over a four-year uh, period. 
Um, underneath that, we have the departmental plans and performance management board. It gets into the more granular detail on how we're performing against that. And then we present this at the um, PCBCSC uh, committee um, um, on a, a two yearly basis in regards to the whole of the CRMP, but actually on a quarterly basis on that, our actual um, uh, performance on a, um, on a regular basis. Um, how we've um, outlined this plan is slightly differently. We've looked at um, uh, that we've put them into four categories in regards to our business, and we're putting everything under either a safer communities umbrella, service delivery umbrella, value for money umbrella, or a people umbrella. Um, that will be consistent through all of our plans within um, Finch Fire and Rescue to, to aid um, the more a bit of um, a focus and simplicity. So everybody understands what they're working towards. Um, going back to what we actually tax as what our risks are, the, the risks that we've identified and that we have done a significant consultation engagement with um, the people of Lincolnshire with, we've identified that the community risks are dwelling fires, road traffic collisions, flooding, non-domestic fires, wildfires, deliberate fires and militia attacks. They're broadly similar to the previous um, IRMP, um, significant um, areas of changes that we have split um, the flooding and wildfires into separate categories, which are generally called severe weather events, and we're recognising um, that the changing of that dynamic um, as years go on will be different. And the organisational risks that we've identified to uh, that will be a barrier for us to live against that is in regards to loss of staff um, uh, for various reasons. The, um, the financial landscape would, could have an impact. Recruitment and retention of staff, uh, particularly in regards to specialist areas and, uh, within our on-call section, uh, and also adverse weather conditions, which also has a, a, an impact with us as well. Um, as I touched on, the, um, the final part of the, the whole of the CRMP was our consultation engagement. Uh, we see this has been a, a particular more successful consultation period from our last IRMP. The IRMP was and our consultation was picked up within His Majesty's Inspectorate last time around that where we had um, little engagement uh, and feedback from the consultation. I think the previous IRMP got approximately around about 170 returns. Uh, this time around, uh, we worked with uh, with the LCC uh, comms and engagement team and we utilised the Let's Talk Lincolnshire and we got nearly a thousand um, responses back and which helped form what the identification of the community risk. So we have, uh, we're confident that we've improved significantly in regards to the public consultation in regards to that. Um, I think I'll pause at that point, uh, Councillor. Uh, uh, Rowan Stacey here is also um, be ably on board to ask any more technical uh, questions. He's the author of the CRMP and did a lot of work in regard to the uh, methodology in regards to how we came through the assessment of risk as well. Thank you very much. That's the pepper. So your scrutiny committee has obviously gone through this with a fine tooth comb. Plus, any comments? Yeah, good morning, Lady. You could say that. Yes, we looked at this uh, <clears throat> on the 30th of January a week ago today, and it did uh, create a whole range of questions, and a lot of interest was created. However, some was not specific to the uh, CRMP, so I'll just focus on one or two that uh, actually were. <clears throat> Uh, Fire and Rescue Service representatives were asked if high-rise buildings and student accommodation should be specifically mentioned in the document, more so in view of the Grenfell, Grenfell tragedy. Uh, however, we were told that these were very much business as usual activities and there was no need <clears throat> for specific mention. It was almost also noted that some Fire and Rescue Services briefly stated their future intentions in the CRMP. Um, maybe such as things in some of their documents was perhaps knocking down two fire stations and building one and things like that. But uh, we did point out that um, maybe the rebuilding of Leverton fire station could be briefly mentioned in there as a possible inclusion. However, again, it was uh, thought it was not necessary to mention. Um, a couple of small inaccuracies were identified in the CRMP. And I understand these have been taken on board for correcting. Um, finally, it was a unanimous decision to support the recommendation to the executive. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. So just obviously Nigel mentioned several points there, the high rise and the, so you've looked at that. Um, 
It was high rise and what was jail well, was student, student, student accommodation. So just summarise what you told committee. Yeah, I, I mean, probably give a bit more right, detail to it. Definitely business as usual in regards to it, and it hasn't significantly changed since the last IRA. You say business justify a bit. Yeah, so to put it into context, Lincolnshire has 19 buildings which we have classed as high rise. So high rise is a, is a very defined point. Uh, so we have 19 buildings in the county. So in terms of a strategic risk, it, it isn't a strategic risk. It's something we do a lot of work on as a business as usual uh, activity. So our fire protection teams will enforce the regulatory reform order in those buildings. And, uh, so they, they get an annual visit at least? They will get an annual visit. So in 2019, it was perfectly reasonable for a split strategic risk. There was a, a huge amount of legislative change uh, as a result of the health tower tragedy. Uh, so it was a, a strategic risk at the time and something we need to put a lot more activity and effort into. Uh, that is now very much uh, business as usual. So a lot of those changes to legislation have come through. We understand the impact of it. Um, but in terms of the, the volume of activity in that area, it was now very much business as usual. Uh, contextually, another area we did remove from our IRMP in 2019 was pandemic. Uh, really, we now will live through a pandemic. And while it is, it is still a risk, it is a bit managed as a business as usual risk. I don't think in 2019 we could conceive of the sorts of activities that would sit outside of our control to respond to a pandemic, such as furloughing staff and sending students home. Those things are outside of our control. So we've now removed that from our strategic risk uh, register in terms of uh, our integrated risk management planning. However, that does still sit firmly as a business as usual activity. Thank you. And in terms of fire stations, um, I'll ask Councillor Detroit about Leverton, but in terms of the estate, is then the, the presumption will stay as is in terms of size. Yeah, so absolutely. So one of our, one of our uh, overarching principles was this, this document is a strategic four-year document. Uh, we wanted to make sure that where we were consulting on any any fundamental changes to our service, it had the, the scrutiny and oversight that it deserved. So whenever we bring a change to service, such as uh, redevelopment of a, of a fire station or a, an extreme you know, knocking down and relocating fire engines, uh, changing duty systems, etc., we would expect that to be subject to a completely separate public consultation to come through this committee, etc. So they've got absolute transparent scrutiny and not hidden within the bulk of a four, five, 10, 15 year plan. So those sorts of activities will come through these committees as separate consultations. Um, so Leverton, progress on Leverton? Richard or? Yeah. Uh, Richard. Yeah, no, no. Obviously we're going, we're, we're doing the, the design stage. We require the land, don't we? Yeah, well, we're quite, we've, Subject to subject to planning. So what we're doing is we're we're detailing up the planning application now to go into to get us uh, to get us the planning for the fire station. Once that's done, we'll obviously be able to go through with the purchase of the land, and then we'll do a, a slightly more detailed design, and then go out to tender for for the for the works. And at that stage, we can obviously come back to council and and look at the costs that are involved with with. The project so that, that's where we are we obviously got estimated costs at the moment which we're, we're looking to uh, can i just ask a question on on this as well while i've got the floor uh obviously with the new building safety act coming in i, I take it that we are the way we approach high risk properties within lincolnshire is the same as they categorize it as well i mean i, I know it's an obvious question but just with it and with it coming in and coming into force now i just wondered that we, we were in tune with the latest legislation that was all the short answer is yes correct yeah we we are uh, absolutely in tune with the rest of the sector uh, in terms of the, the enforcement of the building safety act health and safety executive we've actually put regional resource uh, as, as part of our planning for that so uh, we simply don't have uh, enough uh, demand for that resource within Lincolnshire specifically. So actually, we now have a resource that sits within the East Midlands region that we pay proportionally into to, to furnish that. that okay. Okay. Further questions, and Councillor Boker. Um, leading after um, visiting the children's home at Gainsborough, you are certainly taking your fire risk to heart because you had made them take off all their anaglypta paper with a matter of urgency, which I was very surprised about because it's cost them lots and lots of money. And I didn't really think that was a major fire risk, but apparently it is. But there you go. But um, just reading through the report, it's really good, very good. But you don't mention hoarding. And that's a slight concern because 
we've just come across a very, very, very severe case of hoarding in Wainfleet, um, which ourselves and the local fire service became aware of in October. And I just think we should just mention something and how your officers actually deal with that. They did deal with it because they, they raised it with me, but it, this case is so severe and I am absolutely horrified that I didn't know about it before. Um, so it is something that's really come to my focus of mind, but certainly with the fire going into the rescue, probably not going in, like Wainfleet, for instance, flooding. <laughs> you know, we'd come across this because of that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's not just extension in here. Maybe it's too... I mean, the, to give you some assurance in regards to that, um, so that li links in regards to our prevention strategy. Uh, and our prevention strategy is based on our Sherman concept. I think we have mentioned before, and Sherman within HMAP hoarding is one of the key priorities in regards to that. So, um, so um, again, I spoke really. What I'm trying to say is absolutely it's a, a high priority for us. Um, it, it links in regards to our service plan and departmental plans where it's. Um, uh, is a focus and it is, is mentioned in there and we uh, measure our team in regards to delivering against their areas such as uh, absolutely hoarding um, and hold prevention. We are, um, we link in regards to many partners and we do look at partner agency or the referrals or the intelligence and information to identify where some of these areas are so where we can have that part of the approach to our teams. But um, yeah, so to give you a short, yeah, it's, it's not mentioned specifically within the CRMP, but it is actually within our annual plan and our departmental plans. So, I mean, in terms of well, Sherman, which is basically multi-agency multi checklist, really, in effect. So in terms of, obviously, if you say the fire service come across it and the fire risk, so where does, obviously, hopefully, persuasion, but obviously, in, so obviously it's a difficult scenario because people get themselves into that situation probably means they, you know, they, they, they have, you know, they, they've got themselves into a, a sort of difficult mental state. So wh where does the sort of enforcement action, is it a fire enforcement issue or is it somehow, uh, you know, if there is a serious fire hazard, somebody sitting there with, a, you know, electric bars and loads of books and papers around them, well, so I don't know where the legal situation rests. We, we don't actually have enforcement um powers in regards to that um however we um we what we can have and what we do is and, and ryan will talk about this in more detail is uh, we can signpost to all of our partners who can come in and, and probably have more powers than model fire rescue but i think the key is to identify what the actual risk is and then to link in with all our partner agencies for them to come in and do specialist work but ryan i think you've got more detail on that i think well basically some of yeah we have no legislative powers in terms of enforcing fire safety in in the home uh within a domestic environment where we would have powers would be in um houses of multiple occupation where the there's potential of fire risk to communal areas, so stairways, uh, landings, mm -hmm. et cetera. That's where we would have a, a legislative responsibility. Absolutely, like we work with partners from a, from a statutory perspective. Um, the reality is most of the people we come into contact just need advice to so they're, they're willing and happy to get advice from the fire and rescue service. So we will work with partners to ensure we can signpost them to other services uh, where that's appropriate. But in, in the end of the day, if say the individual says, well, no, my life, I'll choose well, how I live. Is, that, in reality, that's has anybody right. got the powers to say? Um, it certainly isn't within our, within our remit. Yeah, that does. They, they've but got the right it's certainly an issue, but yeah. I know normally sometimes it's almost like people just want help, really, and, you know, they respond. Yes. Uh, yes. Or, yeah. But obviously, basically, again, every other agent is fit with councils and others who go in and um, you know, we, indeed, I presume in social care terms, you know, adult care would be involved to advise and help. That's what I was just saying to Martin about the case that I've got in Wainfleet. I mean, this case is so severe that you can't get in any rooms. Kitchen is full of rubbish, maggots, flies, you name it. So, you know, we are, the services are getting involved. But I agree with you to what power you have. But then again, this six-year-old man is living in an unsafe environment that he, he can't get out if there is a fire because you have to climb out. So it is, it is, it is who has control of that, isn't it? And who can determine whether it, it's 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 about saying has he got capacity with all the intents and purposes he has. He's still driving, but he's living in a very very unsafe house. But it's very difficult. Yeah, so good choice. 
I, I have I think I've maybe brought this question up but, but uh, I'm being scrutiny, but uh, I, I think with regards to this document, and you, I know you're going to say it's business as usual, but with, with regards to Scampton and potential use there, I just wondered how that's addressed uh, within within your plans, really. So Scampton's a um, uh, it is an interesting area for us. Um, there's, there's two areas where we would normally get involved in this type of areas. One is in regards to ensuring uh, the uh, fire safety legislation is, is being adhered to. Um, in regards to Scampton, um, this is a Crown property, so we don't have any legislative duties in regards to that area. Um, although we are um, intrinsically linked with um, all of the working groups and we can give the advice um, and what we would expect. Uh, however, we don't have any uh, powers which we would normally do um, outside of Crown property. Um, so the other area that we um, are linked in regards to is ensuring that we've got a um, an appropriate um, response plan if there was an incident, and that's in ensuring that we have um, an understanding if there's the adequate water supplies, there's appropriate access and egress routes, we can have uh, the right amount of resources getting there, and, and there's understanding um, the type of risk that we will be facing with, with it being a different occupancy. Um, so we work with the local division team and they have those operational plans in place. Okay, thank you. Any further comments then, please? Okay, recommendations on page 211. Basically, do ask us to approve the uh, community risk management plan up to 2028. And then also with that to then uh, publish. All those in favour? Again, unanimous. Thank you very much. So that is agreed. So with that, uh, I will close the meeting and thank you for your attendance. Thank you.